so many things. There's so many things you can talk about. The question is, is where to start? Let's start with people and making judgment on other people in this town. Before you can go and judge on somebody else, you need to look at your own self in the mirror. Let's try it out. We need to seek knowledge, to gain knowledge, to get knowledge, to yes. acknowledge knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> so in the end, we're all people, right? Yeah, and, and everybody then, believes the same exactly. blood, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. It comes out, it's blue inside, mm -hmm. but it comes out red and burgundy, but... Yeah. You got to have people. You got to have people to help you. You can't do it on your own. That's a really big question mark on it right now, because there's so many people that, uh, that's so mean and so hateful right now. Yeah. You know, the more someone has gone through, the more experience, the more knowledge they oh, have to give to others. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that way you can you can show the children or, or the, yeah. the next generation the way to go, the way to live, the way to where to be. Michigan, Southwest Detroit now. And then Eugene, Oregon, which is an awesome Pontotola town. Pontotola is located about halfway between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, I live in the Avenues now. I grew up in Minnesota. And um, it's been since Easter, and the, the surgeon only comes down twice a month. My mom passed away, and everything got a little bit harder. Because once you die, you're gone. You're dead. There's no more. I died five times. But the main thing while we do in this video is... The big shift moving forward is in 25 years, you're going to look back at this tape and these conversations and stuff and, and laugh at what jackasses we were. I've been in medical ed now for over 20 years. Um, I was at Harvard Med for almost 20. I've done consulting with a whole ton of other medical schools. But I've seen a really big shift in medical ed over that time. One thing that I've thought about a lot is that when I first got into medical ed, so it was in the late 90s, people that were the mentors, faculty or people in hospitals were all the generation above, well, me. I mean, they are the people that you would want to see. Dr. Anna Rechocka mieszka w Gdańsku, do którego przyjechałam 60 lat temu, żeby studiować medycynę. Jestem specjalistą okulistyki. Studia Rozpoczęłam w okresie, kiedy mnóstwo lekarzy uczyli nas medycyny w sposób tradycyjny. Profesorowie okazywali studentom dużą życzliwość i starali się, abyśmy zrozumieli, że zawód jest taki, w którym bardzo ważna jest odpowiedzialność i równocześnie trzeba traktować jako misję. No, po latach oczywiście się zmienia sposób podejścia do zawodu i teraz widzę, że 
egzaminy i odpytywanie i sposób nauczania jest bardziej właśnie taki mechaniczny, chodzi o tylko o suchą wiedzę, natomiast właśnie nie ma tego myślenia stricte lekarskiego, nie ma tego holistycznego podejścia do pacjenta, gdzie nie tylko dane schorzenie, ale w ogóle cały organizm potrzebował takiego ciepłego spojrzenia i rozpoznania, co jest ważne i w jaki sposób, żeby nie zaszkodzić, co jest naczelną zasadą medycyny, jak temu pacjentowi pomóc. I keep thinking back and of course all those people are gone now. They've either long since retired. It, it, it was my parents' generation, you know, the World War II two people and just past that. And they really did seem to understand that medicine was an art. It just feels so different to me than it did. It's not about learning, it's like cut and paste, you know, into your brain. And when they have a patient, they're busy plugging the patient into their algorithm. Because, you know, if you throw enough spaghetti at a wall, some of it will stick. You, if you're able to survive your teenage years, you know, you would think that you're going to be able to survive the rest of your life. But it's usually a life-changing event that really kind of joggles your brain a little bit to make you think like life is much more fragile than it really seems to be. That's kind of what happened in March of 2014 and I was a freshman and I was 19 and I was doing a Taekwondo performance. One of the tasks in the performance was to kick an apple off a sword. Now the sword happened to be, you know, mispositioned and when I threw the kick Pretty much the sword went through my foot and went out the other end. An ambulance took me to the hospital and the doctor there told me to go and make an appointment on Monday with an orthopedist. Put my leg right off the bed, blood pour all over the floor. The doctor looked at it and said, try it again. So I did. I put my leg right off the bed and more blood started pouring out. What had happened is that the sword went right through my ankle and out the other end. So I had two holes, not just one. After they sutured me, they sent me out and I was hopping with my crutches to my dorm at 4 a.m. in the morning. My foot was tremendously swollen. I was in so much pain. I got so dizzy. I was really terrified as to whether I was going to make it. I rushed myself to the biggest hospital in the area. There they found out the sword had fully sliced one of my major blood vessels and my nerve and that caused me to lose all the sensation to the bottom of my foot. The first thing I was told was I would never walk again. I, I think of it as cut and paste, you know, and so they don't have the ability to apply that to a specific person. I had to have two reconstructive surgeries. It was a very expensive hospital bill. Yes, for so many people. Later on, I went to med school. I had a mentor. He pretty much told us that beware because I, I noticed all students by the end of med school, they are kind of not themselves anymore. They no longer have a smile. It stuck in the back of my head. I was just like, wow, um, I need to be like self-aware about this. Well, this is about a year into it. I was in a situation where I had to save a fellow colleague of mine from a suicide attempt. And I was the only one there that continued to listen to be there. Now taking all of that, I met a tremendously amazing mentor who was my education specialist, Karen. She kind of encouraged me to really kind of get out there and do one of the things I love, photography. Kind of just go out to the environment and just really explore a lot of the questions I had from my own experiences. And that's kind of what I did. That's kind of what my story became, I guess. Hi, um, it's Karen Wolfsburg. I, it, it's, I kept thinking, oh, it's just me. The veil of time. You know, you look back and things are always better in the past. But when I think about how they were when I started at Harvard Med, and the you know, like in the late 90s, it just, 
it's such a different world. Whatever it is that you do, you don't have as much time as you used to. Brian, find ways to stay plugged in. It's got to be a whole person. Hi, Karen. This is Brian. I'm just returning your call. So I'm thinking about um, going to New York City this weekend. Everything that you say, it, a lot of it, if, if life is like climbing a mountain, and if in medicine our goal is to treat the patient, then shouldn't it be good to also listen to them? I think this might be kind of terrifying. If I'm really going to get any message, I think that's where I should go. Time has come, make a Maybe I can make a video out of it or something. It's a diverse place, so you have a lot of different people from all around the world. So it's almost like a metaphor of like, you know, in today's world, you think of patience and it's like they feel silhouetted on an empty canvas. My mind's made up, never but I think, I think if we just start by just passing the mic, you know, like empower this, you know, patient silhouette, almost like we're painting the canvas. I don't know what, how to say it in a way where I'm just unfortunate right now. I'm, I'm just down on my luck, I'm unfortunate. But it's nothing where I can't adjust to being a man and coming back. I will come back. You know, I, I just made wrong choices in my life. That's all I did. The wrong choices handed me, yes. You know what I mean? But everybody has a chance. So if you believe, just have a chance. And I got a chance. And let me take my chances and becoming a better man than I'm supposed to be. So that's who I am. I'm from the Bronx, from New York City. If it's God's will and I'll be there and I'm going to be helping people in the flood. The thing in North Carolina, whatever they ask me to do, I do. There's no more than us. A job is performed that way. Whatever the boss tells you to do, you just do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But I'm going to do it. Behavior change, diet, lifestyle, these are things that I think can be handled more in the community and less by just shoving multiple layers of pills on top of people. What's the first question? Um, do doctors truly care about your health? No, do I believe doctors truly care about your health? <laughs> they should, they absolutely should. They're just there for a paycheck. I, I've always gotten personally more information from the pharmacist than from the physician. There's a large amount of people who like start feeling like the doctors all are focused on money and like other kinds of things. Sometimes like they could be in a little bit rushed and then like just like prescription, but I believe they're professionals so they know what they're doing. And sometimes I feel like they don't even try to help steer you in the right direction. Maybe be a bit more like personal and just like smiley no not all of them like aren't smiley but maybe sometimes they're a bit like stern and uh, someone who's looking at physical mental and spiritual things together mm -hmm. yeah not just one bio psycho social there's kind of three spheres biologic psychologic and social in the old allopathic model you get in the scope in the stomach they found an ulcer here's your zantac and you know, tag him at the old drugs, that's how old I am, I guess. That will heal the ulcer in four weeks. Well, that might heal the ulcer temporarily. That's not going to take care of you hate your wife, your life, and your job, which is going to have you right back to the vodka, which will lead right back to the ulcer. How's your marriage going? How are you doing? How's the wife? How's the kids? You're supposed to treat the disease as one of those, are one of those fears out of whack, or are all three? And you're supposed to address all three. Hi. Hi. Hi, Karen. Yeah. Hey, it's Brian. I want to tell you because I finished the interviews in New York City and something really special happened. There's this guy I interviewed. He told me that every time someone approaches him, they look away. Yeah, for sure. But today he had the opportunity to speak into a mic. But that's huge. I mean, what you just said is so important no matter where any of us lives. We're all dealing with the same thing. And Part of me tells me I should continue. Do what you can. You still got fourth year to get through. Mm -hmm. 
but um yeah you know i was thinking about providence rhode island um you know that i think you're an amazing photographer so keep doing it thanks i always encourage people not to amputate parts of themselves anyway i just wanted to say brian just again i think there's plenty to talk about and as as the current times continue to unfold there will probably be lots more to talk about anyway bye yep, yep, bye, -bye. hard struggle I guess I just, I don't think of hope when I think of cancer. Um, I do think of people united in hope, but it's, it's, when you hear that word, it's not a, it's not a good word you want to hear. I lost my brother to pancreatic cancer at the age of 48. I lost my father eight months later to stomach cancer, um, eight months later after my brother. I lost both my in-laws within a week of one another to cancer, a good friend of mine's son to brain cancer, who actually um, is someone you associate with in Albany. He was only 15. Um, so I guess it's affected me quite a bit because I've, I've seen a lot of it. So my brother had two and a half months from the time he was diagnosed. Um, it affects so many people and it doesn't matter where you're from, who you know, how much money you have or don't have. I think obviously you have a lot of money, you have a lot better um, quality of life when you're going through treatments. I, I feel for the elderly and people who don't have access to, um, you know, big families and support system that can help them because mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time, energy, emotional, all of that. Yes. Um, um, my, na my name is uh, Brian, and what's yours? Uh, Jamie Owens. Nice to meet you, Jennifer. I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I'm Mary. And I'm Lori. I'm Kyle. Nice to meet you. My biological mother passed away from it. So it really affected me. I was eight years old. Well, my mom died of cancer when I was like 13 years old. My husband had cancer uh, when we were both 38. Everyone knows someone who's been touched by cancer. <laughs> Trying to help a child understand that is just, it's almost impossible. I'm still depressed, man. My whole family died. They passed away. I'm so, so sorry now, about it, that. Oh, no, there ain't nothing big, man, because they're in a better place now. They ain't suffering on this earth. I think everything that needs to come down to a common bond, man, is, is just that we need to seek knowledge, to gain knowledge, to get knowledge, to yes. acknowledge knowledge. Exactly. Because <laughs> in the end, we're all people, right? And, yeah, and, and everybody the end, bleeds the same exactly. blood, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. It comes, it's blue inside, mm -hmm. but it comes out red and burgundy. But Yeah. Hi, my name is Brian, and your name? Brian. Brian. Nice to meet you, Nice Brian. to meet you. Yeah, I, I had mad head trauma, so you know what I mean? I got epilepsy because of it and my speech impediment and all that. I like exactly. this thing. It looks like a, a <laughs> pup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much. Is there, you know, anything you'd like to share? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, for anybody that's going through any mental illness or anybody that's going through any psychological illness or even, even physical illness or... or just do what you gotta do to survive. Cause once you die, you're gone. You're dead. There's no more. I died five times, you know? But um, I just, yeah, anybody in the population that's listening to this right now, man, have a good day. God bless you, peace and love. And make sure you keep yourself well. Cause if you ain't well, nobody will be well. Cause it takes one to hurt one and it takes one to help one. And that's real talk. And that I think is a perfect example when, when life gives you a, a challenge like yeah. this of how you can uh, band together uh, with loved ones and support one another. It's just so inspirational here to see people of all ages and races free to all come together. Lori Celentano, it was just phenomenal that I ran into yes. you and there's a connection there. Yeah. And it's a feel good event. Absolutely. And there are not a lot of those in the world right now. And like almost everyone I've interviewed, everyone has like a personal story, like a personal, you know, reason, like motive and like that courage and strength mm -hmm. that brings them all together and I think it's so powerful. It is, even when yeah. my husband was ill, the, the yeah, yeah. nurses that took care of him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Special people, yeah. so. Mm -hmm.
Eventually I decided to go to Vermont because it's so close to the Canadian border and I thought it would be so cool to kind of hear what are their opinions and thoughts about each of the systems. But even then, in the back of my mind, I kind of questioned, is the problem the system, you know? So you know, like they'll put off seeing the doctor for like yeah. a chronic condition that they're starting to see symptoms of because they just can't afford it until it sure. becomes too big to ignore. And then at that point, it's harder to treat. I'm in my 50s mm -hmm. and I'm a healthcare practitioner. And I think what people don't necessarily understand is socialized medicine means we won't be getting everything. Um, in Canada, there's long wait lines. We have people coming down across the border for elective total hips and total joint surgeries because they're waiting two or three years up there. I'm overweight. I have to pay more for my health insurance, mm -hmm. which isn't a bad thing because yeah. why should you have to pay You know, all those chronic health issues that go along with um, obesity? We first need to figure out how to level the playing field. We can't continue to give away free stuff to people without also holding them accountable. Yeah. How do you do that? I feel like if you don't have socialized medicine, like here in the United States, then you end up waiting really long for health care if you're poor, because then you don't get any. <laughs> 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 that wait is like super long. Stop the steal, won't you? Stop the steal in the soil. program you got, sometimes they're just like, oh, well, we'll cover like 25% of your care. And then you still have to come up with like hundreds or more for like all the stuff that you need to, you know, survive. You shouldn't be allowed to profit off of other human beings' illnesses. That just seems really wrong to me. I would say Canada, um, just because medicine is like not really a privilege. It should be a right in the United States and not everyone has access to medication that is much needed. I would say some kind of modified form of what we have now. Yeah. Like the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, I like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know enough about it to say one way or the other, but I would definitely say that I have already had to wait here many months to get what I want. Like one, one of my friends had um, an issue with like the insurance not wanting to cover a lot of her absolutely ne uh, necessary, you know, like medications and stuff for her chronic condition, and it was just like. It, it made such a huge impact yeah, on like yeah. her personal financial status that she had to cover it all herself just to wow. like survive. So in the end, would you guys pick Canada or US for like the for their system? Canada, definitely Canada. I I, I interviewed, I ran into by chance a doctor from here, mm -hmm. and she was saying that she would prefer the US system because of. Um, she sees a lot of Canadians like all coming down in here because they wait months and months and months. So what do you think about that? So they're on a wait list. It's because their condition is stable enough that they can survive the wait. So sort of like you, you wait and then and then it's like if you want it now, then you're going to just have to pay out of pocket. Yeah. yeah. I'm Actually, I don't want to have a system where the rich get health care immediately and the poor yeah. don't get it until they can no longer afford it or they're dead. That's the system that we have right now. It ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. Till the good Lord tells me so. Uh -oh. It ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. Till the good Lord calls me home. Uh, the stats are telling us that the free market approach isn't necessarily working. The problem is our financial incentives aren't aligned. Whereas in Canada... It's for everyone. You're not lucky, you don't have job, everybody have right to health. Susana, originally from Mexico, but I live in Canada. Almost 20 years. Uh, I think it's better Canadian healthcare because uh, we, get, we pay a lot of tax, but we get service. Some uh, places could be long, mm -hmm. others can be fast. And I think it's also better because it's more... I mean, we pay more taxes, but then we get just more services. We have our private insurance too. Um, so you prefer the healthcare that's here? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Always yeah. good service. From my experience in the American system, the waiting time is atrocious in both countries. My name is Shannon Speth. I'm a Canadian. So I spent 25 years in the U.S. working for some of the prominent healthcare systems, Blue Shield of California and Health Tech. I've recently relocated from San Francisco to Canada. And so I'm continuing my work here in Canada. And whatever the physicians want to sell the patient, they can actually do it. There is a very high overutilization rate in the U.S. We really have to consider the profit motives within a free market system in contrast to other countries that have more of a desire to really just provide a base level care to patients. There's been a lot of in investment here in Canada to promote uh, healthy living. You can relax in uh, many other ways. Why? so complicated like just taking a break our lives, so I and you're feeling a pain and you look the other way to avoid me so much other plans don't you know that that hurts me that you don't need to smoke don't you know <laughs> and that, that hurts me and don't you know that's it no 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 that good that thing hurts me. <laughs> kids uh, see adults uh, smoking uh, bad weeds and it's not a good example it's not good uh, it's not good for the health we don't need to to take drugs you can relax in you know, um, many other ways like hearing nice music <laughs> purely because it's not going to cost you literally an arm and a leg. Exercise, uh, take care of yourself, don't smoke anything, don't drink, eat good food and, and uh, listen good music, be happy. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much, I appreciate it, yes. After Canada, I questioned whether health status is dictated by something deeper than the healthcare system. I just think no matter what it is, I've always encouraged students to do the same thing. You know, Brian, it's been an honor really to, to be able to watch this film come together. Well, it just seems like if there were ever a time for it, it certainly seems to be now. So yeah, keep going. It used to be that all doctors practiced kind of like me in their own clinics and their own neighborhoods, but in the 1960s, 70s, like people started to get bought out by these large systems. They're pressured to, you know, bill at higher levels. They're doing procedures on patients that didn't really get full consent or didn't really understand what was going on. And we as health professionals would rather help our patients be truly healthy instead of continuing to have them dependent on us for medications that don't really solve their problems but just put like layers of band-aids on top of them. You're having, you know, sensitive people knowing that they're doing unethical things all day long but feeling like they have to keep going. This is a criminal, very corrupt healthcare system as you probably have experienced through all your interviews and people's uh, people's responses to you, so. It, it was around that time that I really started to look into what might be contributing to the poor health outcomes in the United States overall. trust the healthcare system. Because it's a business, no matter what, when yeah. you think about it. The hospital, they just want to get paid. Usually people get paid a lot of money for that. And I think nowadays it's all about money. 
mm -hmm. and not about people's feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they really do pull the plug, you know, if they need that, that organ. My cousin's wife, she basically passed about, like last, it's like a week ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. And they pulled yeah. the plug on her, uh -huh. so they just want to get paid. They, mm -hmm. They're there to work, so mm -hmm. they're just like, you know, hey, pull the plug. We can just, um, you know, give them a, 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 a kidney, I don't know. Patients, uh, you know, at this juncture, a lot of people don't under, even understand how the payment system works, and you often hear patients, you know, getting these surprise bills after the fact. Because uh, hospitals are more about making money now before than they were before when they were nonprofit. Now they're pretty much a profit-making business. Yeah. Mm hmm And how about you? I think it might sway their decision. Obviously, we haven't done our part to make the system transparent for the patient to empower them. I mean, even though I'm sure they're, they're having empathy towards the family as well, but mm -hmm. they're there because they're trying to get a paycheck. Yeah. So I'm like in between with that, I would say. There's probably a 20% that are not acting um, in the best interest of the patient. They're acting in the best interest of their pocketbook. This should be like a huge wake-up call. It was hearing all this distrust that asserted a type of curiosity in me. I felt it necessary to discover the foundations of mistrust. If you eat all these terrible foods and get diabetes and have medicine to help reduce diabetes or reduce the effects of it, but you still have it. And without that medicine, you can't get by. You skip it because you can't afford it. All of a sudden, you've got gangrene in your leg and your leg may have to go. They're not even covering people who are actually have illnesses and yeah. need help and they're not like, I gotta pay out my pocket a lot of money for insulin, which I didn't ask to have this disease. My uncle pays 25 cents for insulin. I pay 500 for two bottles. He pays 25 cents per bottle. The external factors affect our gene. So having the same genome, but how it is activated depends on where you are geographically located. In Canada's obesity rate is much lower. The investments, the infrastructure investments, and I see varying degrees of those types of infrastructure investments across the U.S. If you need an example of that, I'm a little hedgehog. Hi! My name is Brian. What's your name? I'm Allison. Allison, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And you're from where? I'm from Montgomery. And how long have you lived here? Uh, 26 years. Oh, wow. Like, my, I was born probably five miles away. Seriously? <laughs> wow, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Sean. I was born and raised in Denver. There's a lot of small markets that support healthy foods and nutrition. Um, you'll find one like every other block in some places. We actually had a, a, a place like that. They have actually closed recently because they had to charge nine or ten to get by. Take the west side of Montgomery where your average income is less than 50000 less than $40,000. Yeah. What do you see here? We have fast food restaurants. I've been broke and struggling yeah, yeah. and they're expensive and I don't want to buy a whole bag that I'm not yeah, sure yeah. if I'm going to eat. Yeah. So I've been craving them for like a month and a half but still haven't gotten them. You know, you're seeing the effects of yeah. food deserts. I'm off at nine o'clock at night after I've been working since 7.30 in the morning, I'm gonna hit McDonald's mm -hmm. or et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. It's almost a part of the city's job to help subsidize or influence people to be able to like financially be able to get better nutrition and better food. And you send your kids off to lunch, mm -hmm. you're giving them like a sandwich, some chips, and like a cookie and a yeah, juice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're raised thinking, oh, okay, that's fine. But yeah. then you get older, it's like, that's a lot of bread. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of sugar. That's yeah. a lot of things exactly. that it's like, okay, but it's the go-to kid food. Yeah. So you've definitely got to start, like, when kids are a lot younger, a yeah. lot earlier. If you eat all these terrible foods and get diabetes, oh, look, you can, you, can, you can have medicine to help reduce diabetes or reduce the effects of it, but you still have it. Another point is a lot of sick people are definitely going to be the last ones yeah, yeah. that can afford that because yeah, exactly, you're paying exactly, for all yeah. your medical stuff, you're paying for this, yeah, and then yeah. that feeds into medical problems even more, then you get added diseases. And it's just this big cycle and it kind of traps people in that. And also people say like preventative health care can be also the cure. Yeah, but who's making money off, off, off reactionary health care? It's, yeah, it's the insurance companies, it's the hospitals, yeah. it's the medical boards, man. Mm -hmm.
If yeah. we could do preventative health care, our health costs would go down. Health costs yeah. can't go down in the U.S. because then the doctors and the nurses and the insurance yeah, yeah. companies and the drug companies can't make their bottom dollar. Like, I'm a good example. I'm 26, but I have like 15 illnesses. Like, I'm getting to a point where I can't work anymore. And so that makes it really hard because I haven't been bringing in the income for a few months. My insurance stopped covering my asthma inhaler. 200 bucks for it. And I'm like, if it get bad enough, I'll go to the ER. That's yeah, yeah. cheaper than getting my medication. It definitely affects the way you eat. I eat a lot more fast food because I can go spend $1.60 on some nuggets and that fill me up. The group of pre-diabetics who are in there, not all of them will become diabetic. A lot of them can change their lifestyle and uh, incorporate more exercise in their lifestyle and then change their diets uh, to be able to slow or sometimes even prevent the onset of Diabetes. How important has nutrition been to your life? Nutrition? Yep. Uh, to my life, it's a 9, 10. It, it's yeah. a 10. Yes, a 10. Oh, yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably say like 7 or 8. My mom in particular, she like has her own garden, tomatoes, all these kind of things. Um, and she goes and helps people around the neighborhood with that. Like if you're a community, make thing is just loving each other and looking out for each other. A lot of this stuff would start fixing itself because once people actually start caring, yep. things get done. It's just making people care and yep. care more than, oh, let me just share this on Facebook real quick. We'll find a home where you loved all the time. Today is my day. Each day he would say. Why is some people making money more important than some people surviving? Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Y'all yeah. have a good so one. Cool. I don't think health should be dependent on the state in which you live. I think all Americans should be given equal opportunity for good health. Leaving Montgomery left me wanting to discover the human story because I, I realized it is the only way to really discover what it is that truly impacts our values, our culture, our beliefs. Ponchatoula is located about halfway between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, about 30 miles north of Laplace yeah. on I-55. My mother and dad passed away when I was probably about 10 years old. I was in boys' homes until I was about 17 before I joined the military. I, I, I got out. I didn't really have no home to go to, so I hitchhiked across the United States and, and um, I found my way here in Louisiana. I came here probably around 20 years ago. So, so tell me a bit about yourself. Well, I'm 40 years old. It's a strange love world. I was a combat medic in the U.S. Army. It don't make no sense to me. Got shot in the knee. Uh, my friend got blown up. There are a few things. Sure. I sewed him up, threw him in a Humvee, and then took off. Ain't nobody got it. 68W, second ID, South Korea, Camp Casey. Ain't nobody uh, got I did my six years. Yeah, I still got uh, PTSD or whatever like that, man. But uh, as long as I stay focused and do what I do, you know, it, it it's a challenging situation sometimes, but. I'll work my way through it, you know, and, and uh, become a better person. My name's Bill Dufresh. I've lived here all my life, 76 years. I just decided one day when I was feeling bad that it was time to uh, make a change, and I did, and I ended up over a year and a half, I lost about 97, 98 pounds. You have that drive to wake up and crank out 500 sit-ups, go for a three-mile run. I mean, you just got that drive. I did, I just don't have the time anymore. Going to work and paying bills is definitely a priority. No. At one time I was a complete health nut and it was an 11. My mom passed away and everything got a little bit harder. Starts with innocence then grows up slow Until the thunder shakes through 
with the advent of the exercise places and everything, I think people are starting to change a little bit. They got four or five exercise businesses here and they're always full. And we walk indoors because it's always dry and the lights are always on. And they got air conditioning. I know my family used to be really tight knit and then it seemed like everybody just fell apart and started doing their own thing. Uh, there is a lot of military here in this town. You know? I mean, look. When the light strikes, I'm military. Every town around us feels the shine. So I know how to eat um, a, lo a lot of protein. Southbound. You can afford to do anything <laughs> you want to. Sorry about that, folks. You yeah. just got to put your mind to it, that's all. Because if your silhouette is riveted in silence, like a wallflower in a dark lit room. Louisiana left me with the question, what are we doing as a nation to ignite the opportunities for our people to live their life to their fullest potential? And for that, I would have to go to the voices of our most vulnerable. I've heard doctors actually, there's nothing more we can do for you. Oh, hell yes, there is. Hey, look, we're all going to die Relax. You're going to cross over. Are they Jewish? Are they Muslim? Are they... I've been teaching interns, residents, students, you know, over 23 years. Our medicine is so important, but their spirit is equally, if not more important. you got to treat their spirit, not just the medicine. Bio, psycho, social. The psychological portion is enormous. I've had uh, experience working in public mental health systems around the country, Colorado, New York in Florida as well as academic experience here as a, as a dean and the head of a research institute. And then for about seven years I was the head of Mental Health America, which is the nation's oldest and largest uh, advocacy organization for all uh, issues related to, uh, uh, to mental health and mental illness. The state of our mental health is very, very poor. If you've had at any time during your life and it would meet criteria for a diagnosis of mental illness, uh, in the United States it's about 50%, about one in two will meet those criteria over the course uh, of a lifetime. Um, people come from Mexico, it's about, uh, uh, the lifetime is about 25%, but after they're here for 13 years, their prevalence rises to 50%. So there's something toxic uh, going on in our culture, at least that's one interpretation. Oh, well I run to stay in the fight, just a glimmer of light at five when I keep open and I know now how much mighty your hand in mine Reaching the same for the very life of me Now I have Before you can go and judge on somebody else, you need to look at your own self in the mirror. Let's try it out. All right, my name is Andre. I'm 50. I'm from Houston, Texas. I've seen so much stuff here in this town. I can tell you some stories that'll probably make you, your skin crawl. Being homeless is really not, it's not fun at all because you get looked down on because you're living out of a bag. And that's the worst thing to do is live out of a bag. And we know about it because we got about four or five bags that we live out of. We got five sleep sleeping bags and it's hard each and every day because there's really no help. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we lost our tent. The uh, water rose and the rain and the only thing I could do was take my wife, put it in a wheelchair and we had to leave all our stuff and all, we lost everything. You know, uh, my wife, uh, she used to go walk. Her bones are deteriorating. You know, when I take her to the doctor, we try to, to address some of the issues of, of, of different situations that's going on with her. And it's like they don't even listen. So I just think that the doctors and the nurses and everything should just listen to what the patient has to say first before they make their recommendation. You know, like I said, I do panhandling. What I usually do is, is in the morning I'll go look for a job and I'll come back and panhandle in the evening. Or I'll go in panhandling in the morning and, pan and go look for a job in the evening. I use the panhandling for the bus fare or the food for the day, you know? Or like my wife, neither one of us have health insurance. I use that money to pay for all my wife's medication. All of it, 100. Okay. We made $200 last week. We made $200 last week. My wife's wheelchair broke down. I paid $200 for that wheelchair, brand new because we got tired of breaking down. So we just spent the money for it. It ended up broke again to where we had to... Fix it again. Fix it again, or sometimes we go to bed hungry, like that night. 
because he spent all the money on the chair. This chair is important. It's just like a car. Maybe that night, because the chair seemed more important. And she fusses, though. She fusses about the chair because she don't want to be in it. Me neither, because I'm used to walking. And the biggest thing is, is what I believe that would get us off the streets and also would make her independent because I, I feel that she really needs to be independent right now to get out to go and do her own things that you know that she needs to do as a woman. You ever come back through? Oh, yeah. well, we, need, we need to do another video. We love doing it. Departing Houston, I was prepared to now enter America's most rough environments, the frontier, to listen to the voices of the unspoken, the untold. And the promise is a promise. We have finished what you started. I was born to believe that the change in the leaves could really mean anything. Love, I crossed the mountains and the ocean for ya. And really capture the impact such environments have on the livelihoods of people. My name is Laura Reno, and this is my son, Jacob Reno. Nice to meet you. And where are you guys from? Here in Bowie. It's actually nine miles from Bowie in the town of Stoneburg. I don't never get sick or anything, so I don't hardly go to the hospitals or doctors. So well, my dad goes all the time because he's a diabetic over here at Bowie Clinic. When my husband was sick, it took me forever to get into there because they either on vacation or there were short doctors. It was like a week and a half when I got his appointment, so somewhere like that. I shouldn't be, but I was so shocked at how inaccessible even basic health care was for so many people in those rural areas. My name's Audrey Green. I'm from Des Moines, New Mexico, and I've lived here my entire life. I'm a first responder, and it takes 45 minutes. Sometimes in bad weather, it can take us an hour just to transport a critical patient. Our um, founder, his dad had a heart attack, and there was no EMS service at this time, so it took 45 minutes for an ambulance to get here from Clayton, and about that time, his dad had passed away. So there are all volunteers out here. We go out middle of the night and Clayton dispatches us, so I think it's doing really good. Just would be nice to have something closer, or quick, you know, get them somewhere quicker, you know, especially if they're critical condition, we have to fly them to Amarillo. And then we used to have like um, a clinic here at the school where the doctors would come down here. And that was nice because with my job and stuff and having two kids, it's easier for me to go to the school with them. But um, now they got rid of it. So they're trying to get the funding for it again. But Cool beans. All right. So um, hi, I'm Yasmin. I am from Houston, Texas originally. Recently moved here to Des Moines, New Mexico, population Five. It really feels like it's that small. Recently found out I was pregnant, um, made an appointment with a local um, hospital, local being 40 miles away still in Raton, New Mexico. Um, that's the big hub where we go if we need any kind of health care because there's nothing here locally in Des Moines. After finding out I was pregnant, I went to go make my first appointment my eight weeks, you know, get my first checkup. Made my appointment, went through all the motions, and showed up for my appointment only to find out that they had my information but no record of my appointment, and they wouldn't be able to see me for another month and a half. And being a newly pregnant person, like I wanted to see someone immediately, um, and so I didn't want to wait that long. I tried to get another appointment. I tried to call and ask for a cancellation, but obviously resources are limited. Um, so my best option was to then seek, you know, treatment or a doctor out in Albuquerque. Um, so now I'm going four hours away to go see my doctor and I'm 35 years old, so considered high risk. Um, there's nobody here that can attend to a high risk pregnancy. So I go all the way to Albuquerque for my, you know, perinatal appointments with a specialist and for my just regular doctor visits at the hospital in Albuquerque at the Presbyterian Hospital. After my experience here, I really don't feel comfortable you know, being here and waiting on the, there's two OBGs here and I hear one might be quitting and we're going to have to be getting um, somebody in from either Clayton or Las Vegas, which is still two and a half hours away. Yeah. They're themselves having a physician yeah. shortage. They're sending girls down to Santa Fe and of course then down to Albuquerque. And you just moved here? Yes, two weeks ago. Yeah, I 
I have to go to the doctor every six months for blood work. Oh, wow. And um, so I started looking even before we moved out here and I noticed that you just, when you're looking online, you don't find as many doctors as you would think that you would find in a city this size. And have you noticed the physician shortage here? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we do have a uh, shortage in uh, uh, physicians. To see a general practitioner, yes, it is a longer wait, um, usually two to three months if you don't have an emergency. So that's why when I went to Albuquerque, I talked to my doctor. She said that any given moment we have, you know, seven OBGs on hand, you know, and those are things that as a mother you want to hear because you want to make sure that you are being taken care of in the best way possible. And of course your baby is being taken care of in the best way possible. Um, so having recently moved here from Houston where at any given moment I can go to a doctor's office 24 hours a day and get any kind of care I've needed that I've needed in the past. Um, being here and not having that luxury, I'm going to say luxury because it really is at this point. Um, I don't know, it's, it's a little off-putting, yeah. you know? <laughs> so much for the country life, free, free, free and uncaring or whatever yeah. they say. This girl I know, she was 39 weeks pregnant and she went in saying something's wrong. The doctor wouldn't see her, wouldn't see her, wouldn't see her. She went back the next day and one of the other doctors just happened to be there and saw her. Well, she had to deliver stillborn. So, <laughs> they would have seen her the day before, maybe might have been different. I don't know, it feels like sometimes they kind of put a level on like importance because like I said, I, to me, my pregnancy is important. I want to be seen immediately, but to them, we can't see you for another month and a half. And that, you know, just kind of, it, it, it gives you no trust in the system. They just got rid of his pediatrician. If that's all you're used to, you don't yeah. know what it's like to just walk into a doctor's office and be able to be seen. I was diagnosed with gallstones and um, it's been since Easter and it's, the surgeon only comes down twice a month and uh, it's, it's taken me a long time to get my surgery scheduled. And this is me just moving here from a big city. I can't imagine people have lived here their whole way of life and just know that there's nothing you can do and they just kind of go with it. So, I know, right? It's bananas. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's an eye-opener out here for sure is, in many is. ways. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Was that okay? No, well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Really <laughs> My journey up to this point kind of pointed to me the gravity of the environment on human character. And entering Colorado, my question was, how does the environment impact our health? Uh, there also is a clear relationship between um, the degree of inequality in a society and the health status of that society. So the higher inequality, the lower health status. If there was a place farther away in the United States, he would have moved there just to get away from it all. But, you know, L.A. was the farthest he could go. I had to learn to get what I need in the dark. It was just, just this whole like ordeal that kind of was really rough for a lot of the family and it split up a lot of the family. I'm losing control, my body, my soul are slowly fading away. But I'm ready now to feel the power of change. I don't know, I, I've been left out of a lot of it because I was younger when a lot of it was going on and so. It was adult stuff. Yeah, sorry, hold on, I'm on the camera, so I have to straighten myself out just a little second. Um, <laughs> I moved here about a year ago from Virginia, and it's just interesting uh, growing up and developing because you start to notice those characteristics in yourself. We haven't really learned how to deal with our emotions and pain, and as a result, we look to something to numb that hurt, yeah. and so we have, this, the way I look at it is we're like a society of addicts right now. They, there may have been a choice at some point, for, for people who have addictions, they no longer have a simple choice about, about how to deal with their problems, and then part of the other issue there is probably the overprescription of, of pain medications. Uh, trying to do better pain management we ended up addicting a whole group of people my grandma she has she's she's on a lot of pain meds and everything and she kind of went through a phase of abusing a lot of different kinds of medications my my uncle um, had a pretty serious heroin addiction for a while um, and he ran away my my grandmother and and my aunt were 
We're kind of like trading medication. I come from a long line of workaholics. Our addiction was one that is um, more or less condoned by society. And a lot of workaholics then turn to alcoholism, drugs, you name it. Well, I don't, I don't know that anybody would choose addiction. Yeah. We're a society of addicts, yeah. whether it's we're addicted to stuff like this. The increasing suicide rate, um, the increasing rates of anxiety and depression among young people, all should be red flashing uh, lights warning us about the fact that we're in trouble in this country uh, in terms of the health and well-being of our population and we really need to do something about it. Like I just, I, I, I do, I frequently smoke, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, it's, it's I, I found myself when I first finding it liking it too much yeah. and starting to do it too much and it was like oh like I right there kind of realized like Addiction is something that just runs in my blood. Like, there's no, I can't get rid of that, and I need to be careful because yeah. it, I could so easily it, just get in that loop. Capitalism is is um, a part of it. Sadly, when it's not healthy, is about selling you a bunch of stuff you don't need to numb some pain that it ain't, the car's not going to do it. In some places where there's nothing to do, it's like the only thing to do is get high. And I think what helps most with those wounds and that healing is sharing our pain and yeah. creating community and sharing our stories. Exactly. And we're scared to death to do that because we yeah. live in this don't let them see you sweat culture. You can see like we have this beautiful landscape and to take advantage of that is like just to be like something you do on the daily, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people like recognize that we have like this space and this like wonderful opportunity. So they go out for sure. Definitely affects the culture. I wonder yeah. if the root cause of all disease is in some kind of emotional imbalance in the system. I think at some point we're going to find out that there's there are common pathophysiological processes that underlie the development of these conditions, and the first uh, problems we're going to see are going to show up as behavioral problems. And those, if they're not attended to, they increase the risk for the development of these other chronic illnesses. In 25 years, you're going to look back at this tape and these conversations and stuff and, and laugh at what jackasses we were that we wrote off two of the most essential, important com components to being human, right? Your thinking creates your reality. If you're not, if, if this system isn't integrated, and that includes nutrition as well as your emotional and mental health, what, you're going to be a wreck, right? Okay. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. It's like, yeah. I had the opportunity to interview for this film, Dr. David Shern. He said the same exact thing, and I think, uh, like, it was just amazing to hear that, you know? Yeah, well, it makes sense. When you look at, like, I think one thing we're learning environmentally, right, yeah. is like you take the wolves away and the whole system goes kaput, right? You put them back in and the system finds a way to balance. It's all systems. This whole planet, our universe, the systems, right? That includes us. And you can't just treat one part of the system and have it be okay. You gotta look at the system as a whole and how one component of the system interacts with the rest. but also just the, the message, it just totally, I don't even have words for it, especially at this day and time. Waiting, waiting for something to come back and haunt me just like it used to. Yes, I'm right here Waiting and watching For that deep dark tide To 
wash over me. Uh, your zip code is much more important than your genetic code. So if you live in poverty, if you live in unsafe neighborhoods, if you're exposed to environmental toxins, and many of these things are all correlated with one another, it may show up first as behavioral health problems. Ultimately, increases the likelihood of development of things like cardiovascular disease or diseases like diabetes. There's no time in seven minutes to discuss the emotional genesis of their physical issues. I what as a nation we're doing to foster really those first responders that actually address all that type of trauma that they see in the environment. Like, are we supporting them? You know, I was thinking about the two EMTs or, or the distances that people would have to go to just get something basic. Um, I, you know, I live in the Boston area. I've almost lived in somewhere in New England, but mostly here. Um, and we tend to take it for granted that, you know, something happens, you've got somebody there right away. There's a contract for public health, but there's no public health. They come from Steamboat to get flu shots, and that's about it. We're in Walden, Colorado, in Jackson County. 1,630 miles, uh, square miles, is what uh, we cover. And a doctor and a PA, or an NP, and they are here uh, five days a week, eight hours a day, and nothing at night and nothing on the weekends. So we take care of everything other than that. So I'm Brian, paramedic. I'm Jim Reiser, paramedic. Together we are. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of paramedics aren't like us. We are like home health. If they're too bad, then we'll. Uh, go get them either in our private vehicle or the ambulance and bring them into the clinic. If we have anybody that's got a stroke, heart problems, multiple trauma, then we fly them down there. You want way up the mountain and then way down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the way it is from here to Fort Collins. Wow. So it'll take you a lot longer to get there. We had pretty critical patients that the chopper was able to land, but that was it. So they wound up taking the patient and the flight crew to Laramie. Medicaid for us, we get nine cents on the dollar, like 75% are on Medicaid. We're almost doing it for free. You know, anytime we go out, we can't even pay for our fuel a lot of times if it's Medicaid. Yeah, we didn't choose to dress like this. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is our place. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have uniforms. And we spend our money on other things. And our ambulances are very well uh, have the equipment in them. Family doctors are probably really, really short. 50 miles from here is Encampment, Wyoming. And they don't have anything. They don't even have an EMS system up there. The last I knew, they had two people, a nurse and this other guy that I know, that were their ambulance. But they got a big area up there that nobody covers. Postcard memories only pain a picture. There needs to be a national effort. Everybody here but, but Brian and I are a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And you can't get volunteers anymore. More than ever before. I'm waiting for you to come back. 20,000 doctor shortage is, is, is a big number and uh, I'm pretty sure there are more than 20,000 every year uh, guys like me. We, I can say we now because, you know, putting myself like, like everybody else that is coming from, from somewhere else. But they are doctors. They are doctors and they are good doctors. They passed all the steps, but it's very hard for them to find a residency. I was orthopedist and traumatolog in my country. I did so many surgery and uh, I was working with American doctors in war. And when I came here, they said no. I came here in the United States 14 years ago. It was uh, very hard for me to find a job. But after I passed the steps, it was very hard to find a residency and I was just doing the application, application, throwing 
money and uh, I couldn't find any residency. I found a uh, work in medical field, but not as a doctor. I was as a medical assistant taking vitals. In this situation are, are the other doctors also. To, to have the license to practice medicine in the United States, I can go for 10 years somewhere in a rural area and to work over there with a, with a minimum payment. And that means it's not about the money, it's about the, the hobby that I have is to be a doctor and that's it. <laughs> the economy is really bad um, and so there's definitely an ongoing shortage in those areas. You know, the way that I practice is trying to prevent, trying to prevent, and it's, unfortunately, it's very time consuming. And so I think the way that a lot of um, practices function these days is on high volume, and there is no time for teaching. Um, and so I see less patients for more time, which definitely impacts my income. Um, but I feel like that's so important to providing a good um, outcome. I'm Charlotte Mason. I'm a nurse practitioner and a doctor of nursing practice in Jackson, Wyoming. But I also do work in Big Piney and Pinedale, Wyoming, which are actually Big Piney is considered frontier. Um, and there is just a constant need for providers in those areas. It really is like, where is my next meal going to come from, and um, how can I get drugs, or, you know, there's a lot of meth. We have one mental health clinic that's state-sponsored, but the list is always at least three weeks long to get in. Um, cost is such a huge factor. Part of the reason that suicide rates in the western part of the United States are higher than suicide rates in the eastern part of the United States is a tribute to the fact that there's much greater gun availability in the western part of the country than there is in the eastern part of the country. People, I think, would get mental health counseling so much more often if, it, if there wasn't such a cost factor involved. Every day that happens. Um, patients will come in and like, why is your blood pressure so high or why is your asthma out of control? Well, I never filled that prescription because it costs too much. We can take the time as healthcare providers and just and educate the patient. If I give you this antibiotic, it probably won't help and it might hurt you. They're like, oh, well, I don't want that. How can I just feel better until I get better? And that takes an extra five minutes, but then it pays off in the long run. So, yeah. They're giving people drugs all day long without the patients understanding in a seven minute visit what the real risks of taking the medication are. For the free market approach to really work, we need patients who are empowered. People often wonder, like, why are my patients so disengaged? Why do they seem not to be participating? It's like, well, you're holding them hostage to something they don't want, and they certainly don't want to pay for it. So that's why you're sending them to collections. They feel dissed in the whole process. They have not had any opportunity to share from their heart and soul what they want to receive and what healthcare means to them. So. I, I explored the Southwest's diverse cultures to, to do what I learned America's system does not. And that's, that's studying the science and the impact of listening to the human voice. I was at Harvard Med for a long time, and so I had a, a student who used to play music all the time. And he just didn't anymore. He felt like he didn't have permission to do that because he had to be studying all the time because he was really struggling. You know, we worked on that, and I finally got him to agree. And I, I just think no matter what it is, like for Brian, you know, don't give it up. That's all I'm saying. I don't know any mm -hmm. Navajos have doctor degrees, zero, as far yeah. as I know. Do you, do you think it's and, more of like a cultural thing, or do you think it's more like... Well, <clears throat> life goes on, so 
every day we have to have food and we have to have you know things yeah yeah and so the pressure of life comes down on us like uh, going to school you're not bringing in money yeah to survive on to mm -hmm. live on so and the schools yeah. here are really poor i've seen anxiety come seeping from your scalp i've seen the nightmares come to life and beat you down and not a word i said could make this any better so i wrote it out until the night was still if money makes you merry well i spent it all to know but i pushed the plan now cause i can't pay the mayor to go there is no complaint that makes this any faster so i wrote it out until the day was still i paid the piper paid the rent i am anything but spent when everything is gone they can't take away our songs but our job is constructing uh, environments that support them and then encourage them to be their very best rather than, like you were saying, encouraging them to go on disability and basically give up on their life's dreams and hopes. Um, Research in its true sense is we are going to find something new. If you live in poverty, if you live in unsafe neighborhoods, you cannot wear blinders and just go in one way. You have much poorer health status overall. You have to open up and look at everything and we have to go with what the data tells us. We put forward hypothesis, we test our hypothesis, and at times we get some results which are really, really surprising. There is nothing we could do to calm the ocean. So we rode it out until the waves were still. I paid the piper, paid the rent. I am anything but spent when everything is gone. They can't take away our songs. I paid the taxes, paid the priest. There is nothing out of reach. It's better than it's. Yeah. And my wife warned me. Cause love don't cost a thing. When I first met her, and she agreed to marry me, she wanted me to do this. She says, I want you to get me, her, yeah. as far away from here as you can. Yeah. And I didn't hours and five minutes. Hey! Help me off. Right on. Uh, okay. Just go, go straight back out that way. Yeah. Just a couple of miles up that way, you know. Okay. I was going to take a straight cut. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Appreciate it. Appreciate the ride. Yeah, no problem, dude. You feel you like you can go through here. This way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm out of food, so I'm just trying to find some resources to fall back on. Yeah, Nothing. yeah I have a, um, some canned chicken left. Oh, that's so cool. So you want doing it? research? I've been at, like doing interviews, so like oh, asking okay. everyone around. Well, you know, I do live out in the backwoods and, you know, it, it may look like, you know, people don't live nearby, but, you know, there are a lot of people that live nearby, you know. So what's your name? Brian. Brian? Yeah, what's your name? Joey. Joey, nice. Nice to meet you, Brian. Nice to meet you. Is nice that your dog? Yeah. yeah. Right this way? Yeah. This way? Yeah, just, you can just turn it on right here. Here? Yeah. Go, go. I live down down in there. Oh, okay. So just go that way? Oh, 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 oh. They're fine, you know. They're, they're, they're on this. Do you want to film the interview? Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. You cannot wear blinders and just go in one way. You have to open up and look at everything, and we have to go with what the data tells us. A lot of the elderly, they, they they knew which plants and what would work for what, you know. My name is Joey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And uh, where are you from? I'm from Black Mesa, Arizona, Navajo Nation. I think majority of the doctors, they just like, they're not really around for that long to learn yeah. the whole thing. For instance, uh, an ant bite, you know. You know, you can get, you know, I, but I don't see anything around here, you know, that, yeah. I would show you, but just right when they start getting to learning stuff like that and they get moved on to another facility, the majority of the elders, they perished and, you know, there's very few people that know which remedies. It is sad, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, hey, my name is Denver. And I'm um, like Colorado, but Denver, not Colorado, but Denver Blair Nash. And 
I'm just um, enjoying the um, nice day on a um, autumn. Well, I hurt my ankle and I went over here to the local clinic. And they told me, oh, it's just bruise, put some ice on it. Aujourd'hui in Navajo, that's the beauty way, you know, kind of balance. So I went to Tuba City and then their medical people, they x-rayed it and they said, you have a fracture. <laughs> Don't eat too fast, Grandma said, or something like that. <laughs> we should have listened. And I went here, and the doctors just said, oh, just put some ice on it. It'll be OK. And it got worse. And again, I went to Tuba City, and the doctors there told me, you got a gout infection. And they were like, what is wrong with Kianta? Takes care of his ride, his horse, whatever, you know. And he works on his house. He built a house. And that's what they say, Navajo, oh, yeah. if you're going to have a family, build your house. And um, I see the, um, the uh, reason they say that, you know. I was having like some chest pain and they didn't know and they told me that I had some, like a little fluid sack. And I was surprised when I went to Tuba City and I was there and one of the doctors was talking Navajo to one of the grandmas and he's like, yeah, how do you, when you say, Grandma and Navajo Shimba were asking how and he's like, how, how are you feeling? What's wrong? How again it goes to communication is the differences if, uh, in the trust. When I fell through the roof and mm -hmm. you know, you can probably see my head injury, yeah. you know, it took maybe at least an hour for the paramedics to arrive and I was like walking around with my scalp hanging up yeah. hanging to the side of my head. But you know, I I managed to if the, the, the dirt changes color, you're on the wrong wrong road, turn around, <laughs> so go back to the other on the road and you're no longer on the road. <laughs> yeah. A lot of these roads yeah. are unmarked. and Don't you guys have GPS? I have GPS in my car. and you know, A lot of us don't have access to electricity and stuff like that. But it takes a while yeah, for them to get there yeah. and find, find the person you heard or something. Sometimes it's kind of like too late. Go Hey Karen, this is Brian. I'm sorry we got disconnected back earlier. This is just the way of life out here. But yeah, I was going in to get some shoe strings, but um, you know, I appreciate this talk. You know what I'm starting to recognize? Remember how I told you that empowering the patient is like painting a canvas? Well, I'm really starting to see a painting. Oh, um, anymore. And I can, I can run a show. Find your way back to wherever you belong. Denver Nash, um, I will have a show, maybe a movie, and a soundtrack. Very difficult at first. Just keep looking up to the stars. All right. Denver Nash. Um, Thank you. you know, but um, I'm talking on behalf of all my, you know, of all the people here on Navajo Reservation. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate right, you're, it. You're yeah. welcome, Brian. Nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah. I really think that once you actually appreciate kind of the extent of how much we're products of our environment, you become such an open-minded person. Kind of to the point where you can start really respecting everybody as their unique individual and going forward. I just embrace that. I think what we're going to find out is that exposure to those adverse circumstances and living in this constant state of uncertainty, uh, which, which happens when you're living right on the margin of homelessness, that those are the things that are dysregulating uh, these endocrine systems, the cortisol system, and this, you know, and the stress response is pretty well understood. That has effects on the brain. Hi, my name is Brian. Hi, Brian. Mark. Hey, nice to meet you. Good to meet you too, man. Yeah. Um, and where are you from? Well, I've been living out here for a year and a half. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. So yeah, been, this is my home now. Nice. Yeah. And you've lived here for. Two years! Wow. And I'm never going back! Good luck! <laughs> so, the first question, I think doctors know enough about preventative health. I would say, I, I hope that they would, but from personal experience, my doctor does not um, know about that kind of thing. Singing all these questions uh, that I have for you uh, now. Don't throw them under the bus. What is love? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, that's why, what I do is I do a lot of, uh, you know, crystal and energy healing. Just say what you were doing today on the beach. Oh, I, I was picking up plastics and garbage on the beach just as a, a purpose while I'm walking. It gives me a purpose, uh, you know. Do you think doctors um, know enough about, like, preventative health care? Uh, no, not, not enough. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Well, you need to treat the whole person, not just the disease. You know, if your lifestyle's bad and you're still smoking and you got asthma and you got, you know, you shouldn't smoke. Anything else you guys want to share? Love. Love. Yes. <laughs> what is love? Love is the mission. What is promise? Be your man. Be your slaves. What is promise? What is love? doctors understand preventative health care. I feel like they should know a little bit more. What do you think? I feel like they know like what the effects on the body but yeah. not on the brain you know. Because sometimes the medicine that they give you harms you more than helps you. Yeah. Oh I man you go into any gas station, any grocery store, what's right by the counter? Sugar, 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 fat, fat, fat. I believe our food is our medicine. I'd like to see more alternative medicine be more widely used. I mean, whatever statistics show, I'm just... Why, why disregard that when people can actually feel, whether it be a placebo effect or directly relating with the body, if it can help somebody feel better. When I've asked alternative, you know, medicine questions, yeah, they've specifically said, that's not my job. Using Eastern medicine and the chakra system to relate to the human body, which is, so if someone has an imbalance in a certain part of the body, there's going to be a certain stone that's good for them. The heart, the, the rose quartz, you know, it brought out a lot of these, you know, very good emotions in me for different things that I want to um, accomplish in my life. That's a common theme I've seen is people, the more positivity you have in everything you do, I just see much more happier people. Yeah, this is, this is what I love doing, this is what I believe in, in doing, but there's a lot of different ways to, you know, for people to, to feel good and feel better. We shouldn't disregard any different yeah. modalities because there's, there's a place for, place for, it, for all of them. You know? I think the proof is with the patients having their benefits from homeopathic medicine, from massage, from things that they try where they tell me, I'm not in charge, you know, I just, I consider myself a guide. I'm not like a dictator, right? So I guide people in the direction that I think would help them. Step by step, hearing each and every person, it made sense why we have so much distrust. I'm just, yeah, I'm yeah. actually mm -hmm. terrified of the flu shot. Like, yeah. I mean, if they would actually tell you what is in it, mm -hmm. that would probably, but they're like, you know, kids with egg allergies, mm -hmm. even though my father's a psychiatrist and he was a doctor yeah, before yeah. that, mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. so not into that type of medicine. Uh, I've heard bad things about the flu shot too. It, it also has a hidden uh, debilitating uh, uh, compounds. The new strains of flu virus, so it's like, yeah. it becomes like, okay, well, we, maybe we created a new flu yeah, virus, yeah. things mm -hmm. like that. I've seen my own family get mm -hmm. compromised from things that doctors have told them to do. I mean, I, I had an accident with my hand and oh, wow. um, mm -hmm. they told me I was not going to be able to use it. Yeah. As soon as they told me I wasn't going to be able to use it, started exercising my hand. I was like, no, I'm a chef. I, I, I depend on my hands. I personally avoid all vaccinations. It's a little bit iffy. I, because then I, yeah. I, read, I read in the news uh -huh. like... I've done a little bit of reading on that. Teach me how to take care of myself rather than just yeah. um, preaching at me what I have to do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've seen people get flu shots and get even sicker, or been like, "What well, is it, the shot? I'm, I'm like the sickest I've been in my whole life." He got a flu shot, and what happened? Well, it just made me feel ill for for a few days. I'm still alive. 
right? I'm still alive, yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah. Healthcare is pretty complex. It, there's still some art to it. It's not purely science. It really depends on a patient by patient basis. I put my trust in medicine, but I yeah. still have uh, my doubts in it as well. I mean, I'm, I've had dogs yeah, that I've yeah. given shots to before, mm -hmm. and some of them haven't even died from getting shots, you know? Wow. So it's like, so really? I'm just, wow. yeah, I mean, and that's supposed to save him, yeah. so. He says he believes in mm -hmm. shots of all kinds. Yeah. He gets rabies, distemper, bordetella. They are just churning people through and limiting them to one complaint per visit. Primary care needs to be in the community and not hooked up to tertiary care medical centers. Like, there's no reason why, if somebody has an ingrown toenail, they should have to try to go into a five-story hospital with a helipad. Do you think it's important to get the flu shot? Yes, and I did. Mm -hmm. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> You're the first one I asked today. <laughs> awesome. I think that so much of healthcare is about the education. I think for physicians, it's how well do they know their patient population. Yeah, I'd rather, uh, rather have a few uncomfortable days than mm -hmm. the flu. Yeah, that's true. And then not pass it on to someone that is more, you know, immunocompromised or right. can't get the flu, you know. Let me let go of my sorrows, let them sink inside the bottle, live in like it's no tomorrow. All we need is drinks and music, used to dream, and now we have the chance to do it. Sing! There's always something you can do. There's always something you can do, but I don't have another pill for you. No, there's spirit, psychologically. That is more important or as important as any medication I've ever written. Before you can go and judge on somebody else, you need to look at your own self in the mirror. Let's try it out. I mean, there's nothing great about a community that doesn't help itself. And yeah, yeah. It, it, at this day and age in America, the community isn't very conscious of the fact that it's even a community. Yeah, yeah. Like, like at large, like neighbors are not neighbors like they used to be. Nobody seems to have any, any sense of camaraderie with people that they live around you know it's like ooh, a neighbor I, I hope they don't talk to me while I'm unloading groceries or something almost everyone has at least one t kind of mental illness now I feel like so I think medicine should be very humane mm -hmm. and you have the right to be yourself yeah. and I think as long as it's not hurting anybody you should be able to do whatever you want and I guess that the Sun mm -hmm. doesn't judge oh today I'm gonna shine only for this person yeah. and not this other person it shines for everyone yeah. My name is Ryan. Fire. I'm Jordan. I'm Cap. Fury. I'm Marion. Power. Hi. My name's Hi. Brian. And what's your name? My name's Marsha. My name is. My name's Brian. What's your name? My name's Ryan. Legend. Oh, cool. Yeah. Right. I'm the hammer. I'm the hammer. I'm the gavel. I'm the gavel. And my wrath will come raining down. I'm laying down. Diabetic and they screw me over, then they're not like I gotta pay out of my pocket a lot of money for insulin. I'm just I am. I didn't ask to have this disease. Yeah, I am. So you prepared like more of the Canadian type of insulin? Yeah. Then? My yeah. uncle pays 25 cents for his insulin. I pay 500 for two bottles. This is my name. Lo puedo tomar. Mm -hmm. uh, um, hola, mi amo Brian. You can mm -hmm. see your number. Mi nombre es Liliana Morales. Yo quiero que se unan todas las naciones, países enteros, a clamar justicia por todos mis niños sí. nacidos aquí, uh -huh. por todas las madres solteras sí. y por una, por una ayuda médica justa. Tanto racismo hacia el emigrante. A mí, la comunidad es mi escuela. De sí. ellos aprendo, porque ellos, Como trabajo para ellos, vienen a llorar en mi hombro, a darme sus quejas, sí. sus lamentaciones, y yo sufro por ellos. Sí. Yo soy la voz de más de 11 millones de migrantes. Sí. Y mi nombre es Liliana Morales, y pido justicia para todo aquel emigrante, y pido médicos. I'm the hammer, I'm the hammer, I'm the gavel, I'm the gavel, and my wrath will come. que nosotros como madre soltera tenemos aquí gracias por darme la oportunidad y quiero que y quiero que esto corra a todas las naciones 
que mi voz se escuche y que me respeten, que se me atienda y que se me oiga la voz. Gracias por darme la oportunidad. Sí, un respeto para toda la humanidad. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Sí. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, tell me if if you have anything else you want to say um, about me our healthcare, medicine. You know what I really want to say? Uh -huh. That I don't care if it's in healthcare or medicine. Yeah, yeah. In every mm -hmm. aspect in life, I could mm -hmm. say that people, it's time to awake and uh, mm -hmm. the values need to be on humanity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not, right? not on the race, not on how you look or uh, not on that kind of stuff, but on humanity, period. Mm -hmm. We are, I think that the world is changing big time. It's changing right now and globalization, it's getting and gentrification yes. is getting everywhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's time to wake up and accept the reality. It is what it is. I'm, I'm from Chile, in this country I'm Hispanic, mm -hmm. and in my country I'm more likely Chilean. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I am Loreto, mm -hmm. and that's the main one. Yeah. I am Loreto and that made me who I am. Mm -hmm. And I don't care about religions mm -hmm. uh, or races or anything else uh, or social status. I think that we have to look at humanity. Okay, sweetie, my boss. <laughs> so now more than a year later, I was like coming into Browning, Montana. You know, at the time I didn't realize that that would actually be the city that would put the nail in the coffin to kind of answer the very first question I had. Is health status, you know, dictated by something that's deeper than the healthcare system? And that's where it got answered. Okay, uh, hello, my name's uh, Leon from Browning, Montana. And as you can see behind me, we're having Montana weather. It's May and it's snowing. It's our, our medication is free. Mm -hmm. Our healthcare is free. Um, stays in the hospital are free doesn't cost us anything because we're enrolled members of the Blackfeet tribe. They have everything for mental health, they have everything for dietary, we have diet dietitians that will take you in and uh, talk to you and show it, run run off papers for you, what you can eat, what you stay away from and yeah. everything. They do, they go over that, all of that with you. There's not enough jobs, okay, then there's people that don't want to work. And then we have our street people, our alcoholics, you know, and stuff. And I try to reach out to them every year. This will be our 15th year that we have Thanksgiving for them. And they all come over to the, church, the CCD Center and they all come in and eat. But my goal for me, get cots and blankets and all that stuff and put them up so they got a place to sleep oh, yes. and stay warm. Absolutely. Yep, yeah, very big problem. Now it's drugs. Drugs? Drugs. You know, it's meth, I know. Meth, no. There was kids my age and stuff that all drank and everything, you know, and... I just, I'm not a drinker. Yeah. I smoked and I quit 22 and a half years ago. Congratulations. You know, and I had to have a triple bypass for that too, but that's my fault. You know, but yet the hospital paid for it, my insurance paid for it, and it was a hundred thousand um, dollars. It's not getting any easier, it's getting hard. So, anybody that sees us, pray for a reservation. This is the Black Indian Reservation. Pray for us, pray for all the reservations. So, do you think if funding kind of went into preventative care or like prevention care and trying to work maybe with children before they get into? you know, that type of influence. You know, we might, some people say, oh, Indians, you know, or whatever. Hey, it is what it is, you yes. know. Absolutely. Exactly. Hi. And I love kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, my heart goes out to people, especially the children. It really does. You know, because they, they need that stuff. What we do is work with kids in school environments and home environments and we identify the environmental factors that contribute to their behavior issues. And so they collected information about 10 or so adverse childhood experiences, things like physical abuse, sexual abuse, 
uh, having a parent who had mental illness or addictions, having a parent who was incarcerated. What ultimately they found out is that these turned out to be very powerful predictors uh, of, uh, of the development of a whole host of problems, um, some mental health problems, but also increase the risk of uh, development of cardiovascular disease, of uh, endocrine diseases uh, like diabetes. I think that would really help if they can get into the schools when they're little. ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. It should be in the schools for children that don't have disabilities or just like everybody. It works on replacing maladaptive behaviors with more appropriate behaviors that help them in adulthood. Problematic behaviors like smoking, which causes obviously the cascade of other sort of health problems. And it's a very graded effect. You know, the more of these uh, adverse experiences that you experience uh, as a child, uh, the greater risk you have later for the development of diabetes and these other, these other conditions. I also teach baptismal classes and I always tell my parents and my godparents, you are your child's first teacher. Whatever you teach them to do, I said, if you teach them to smoke cigarettes, drink beer, do drugs, steal, that's what they're going to do. But if you teach your child not to be like that, go to church, behave, don't talk back, that's what you want. We catch these behaviors before they turn into something that is harmful. Really, when you have children, you have to show them, you know, don't do as I do. If you're drinking and smoking, ah, it doesn't mean it's right, you know, you can't do that. What do you expect from them? If kids are not targeted early, they will develop inappropriate coping mechanisms, um, things that will not be helpful in adulthood. That's everybody's future is our kids. Increasing focus on early childhood education, on social, emotional, healthy development as critical investments for, uh, for the health of our country. If a child is screaming and the mom gives them candy. The behavior is never going to go away. You're just going to keep reinforcing it with candy. I got five of them that are all grown up and married and I got one left at home. I was, I was very stern, very stern with my kids and I have no regrets. At some point we're going to have the sense that all of these things are in fact related to one another uh, and that a very high leverage investment in, our, in the public's health would be in decreasing the degree of adversity uh, experience uh, by, by young kids. Yep, and just like with my kids, I always kissed them, I always told them, I love you. I didn't care where we were. It didn't matter to me. Yeah. As long as it was, they knew, yeah. they always knew I loved them. That's and they show, they would show that, and I would show that. Now, they show it to their children. This was not an easy journey, no. Sometimes it's a lot of pain that inspires something. Part of it is that everyone I've spoken to felt like we've distanced ourselves from humanity. Humanity is our home for humans. So I froze a chunk of my life because we need this message for just each and every one of us to take a pause, take a breath and recognize the true value of our communities and reflect, take, take the time to listen. But first open the heart, open the mind to understand new ideas. Welcome different people. Learn, learn to trust. As from the beginning, we, we are alive for just an instant. So ask, ask yourself what type of energy or imprint you want to leave on this earth. Because everyone has a purpose. We need to ask ourselves how can we help others discover their own. And and that's that's community. That's that's where the heart of medicine sleeps. It's on now? Yeah. Video me now. Yeah. So just relax. Alright. Okay. And share anything you would like. Stop being allergic to each other. It doesn't make any sense. You don't want nobody to judge you. Now understand, God gave me a job. I believe that 
This warehouse that I work in is the earth. And on earth, every box that's on the ground is a human being. And he tells me, Andre, you take that box off the ground, you lift it up, and you lift it up to the top shelf. And what my job is to do is lift up your spirit, period. You are the box, I lift you up and put you on the high, the high shelf. So that means that you can't go no higher. So I'm gonna get you high as can be. And you have to just be it. So I mean, you know, I'm just gonna, trying to get on the right track and I'm on the right track. I'm just gotta move the, the train. The train, you understand? The train down? No, I'm saying it as, as a metaphor. Oh, yes, yes. You understand? That's uh, all. Yeah. It's a metaphor, you yeah. know, for the train has to go. Yes. And I got to go, too. I got to get better. That's my goal. Absolutely. What, what are you going to do in North Carolina with the flood? Like, how are you going to help them? I don't know. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I just know that I have an opportunity to go if it's God's willing. If it's God's willing, I'll be there, and I'm going to be helping people in the flood. Whatever they ask me to do, I do. There's no more than us. A job is performed that way. Whatever the boss tells you to do, you just do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But I'm going to do it. Negative yeah. fuck. <laughs> That, that is the art of medicine, and it's not something you can learn in a textbook. It is, it is something so much deeper than a pill. something special with integrating science with emotional intelligence and the sacred interaction of a human to another human. Basically handcuffed and chained by the family we're born into. You do a little, if everybody does a little, the world can be a better place. And uh, as you can see around you, I mean, people are always, uh, you know, they're just just being around the mountains and the water, and it just pushes people outdoors. And uh, people are always hiking and always running and always biking. So um, we live in a city where, you know, that's kind of you're motivated to do it. Yeah. see other people do it, so it's kind of cool. Well, with our healthcare system in Canada, in schools and stuff, we get community health nurses that come in, and I have some nurse friends at work, and it's all about educating. It starts from the bottom, um, healthy living, you know, the Canadian food guide, and then um, even in schools, they give you vaccinations, so um, it's true. Yeah, no, I yeah. mean, you definitely see people walking a lot more here as well, which is good. So I, I think the level of fitness and health seems pretty good. It has to be a lifestyle, right? You can't put a Fitbit and hope that, you know, increasing awareness will all of a sudden make them walk more. Make it enjoyable for people, like give them the option to walk to work, put in the sidewalks, put in the bike lanes. Boarding facilities actually increase mental well-being. How can we improve cognitive function? In general, the um, recommendation, you know, when you're still healthy is you know, to remain active, to eat well, to get exercise. 
and to use your brain because it helps to keep cognitive resilience. Hi, I'm Jessica. I am in Seattle for the summer. I'm a travel nurse from Omaha, Nebraska. I work in oncology, so the expense is, I don't ever know how anyone does it. Some of the like study drugs can be ten, twelve thousand dollars a bag. We use different charting systems. We can't get their CT records. If it's like an emergency, then they just have to get another one, which those tests aren't cheap either. I think they have better systems in Europe, for example, like Spain, they're in the top 10 in the world and Americans think, we think we have the best of everything and I, we really don't. We should learn from people that are already successful and stop reinventing the wheel. My name is Sarah, I come from Germany. If someone's sick, you don't have to pay, pay $100,000 or something for your hospital bill. If you say you have a specific problem, the doctor will reserve much more time for you. It does not cost more. But I think with proper nutrition and a strong immune system, we could avoid a lot of medical costs. So I think the root cause is lack of good nutrition and obesity, lack of exercise. And awareness. Yeah, I think our system is much better, but I think the thinking here in the United States is so different. The people want to be independent from the government and don't want to be pressured. That's something people have no idea about. They think it's only for themselves, but it's more to protect the greater population, everybody. For especially my patient population, the oncology patients that don't have any immune system, people doing transplants, they can't get revaccinated and they have to because they basically have a whole new immune system. So I think a lot of people don't understand the herd immunity piece where you're not, maybe you're healthy, but it's more to protect the elderly people, the babies, and people who have bad immune systems. We're a hodgepodge of many, many people from many places of the world. We really don't have um, our culture is really blended. My hometown is uh, back in Chile, in Santiago. It would be a good idea to help to uh, incentivate eating healthier. Put the phones down and get to know one another and, you know, find common interest and, com you know, commonality and how you could make your little space in life a better place. Hi. Hi, Karen. This is Brian. I was just calling because you're never going to believe this. They painted, they painted an empowered patient. You know, one of, one of the things that he said to Brian that really struck me was that we all need to wake up. How do you think we're supposed to frame it? I think it, it needs to be an effort that is collective and, and that's a lot better for everybody. Yeah, that's true. I just really hope this brings change because, you know, I, I don't want to see patients silhouetted on empty canvas, you know? We need to wake up and I think it's starting to happen. I was born into a system constructed for failures. I sink and ship me in mind by drunken sailors. And escape bars behind the bars of the jailer. And this matter attack and they withhold the inhaler. If the shoe doesn't fit, what good is a tailor? In the midst of this crisis, please cancel the gala. Without a symphony, there's no need for a prelude to foreshadow what's to come. See the secret committees commence with their meetings to make red tape in response to simple questions. Questions threaten the perception of a beneficial system or pyramid scheme with its cogs and its pistons. Mechanization of man making more and more live in a miserable existence. How can so few claim so many victims? And this begs the question. My arrest is a weapon against the oppression of man's obsession to control things. Look at the long line of make believe kings, and the Lord of the Flies wants you to kiss his ring. Follow new rules with invisible strings and become a puppet in a diabolical scheme how the good men become a part of the regime they don't believe in resistance like right now you have a highly abusive system that is profiteering this is the sickest model of business i've ever seen in my life we have people that are profiteering off the hopes and dreams of our beautiful human beings you've ever seen grace the planet ever walk across our planet and they are being held hostage. Hi, I'm Dr. Pamela Weibel. I'm a family physician in Eugene, Oregon, which is an awesome town where everyone's friendly and they all hug and hold hands. And we have farmer's markets on every corner. And we also have had a lot of physician suicides here. So it's kind of alarming and shocking. And I did a series of about nine town hall meetings, interviewed a hundred different people or more, but I did get about a hundred pages of written testimony about what people really want in an ideal medical clinic. And I opened the first clinic designed entirely by patients. You see, this is very important. 
my medical record is not between me and my patient. It's over here. It's really nice when you can actually have a surgery table that makes you feel happy about helping somebody remove their skin cancer with love and hope, right? Instead of just quick pushing people in and out, this artwork is done by my patients. It's not just me holding people hostage to something that I think is cool. You're actually sitting on something that you would want to sit on, which is not going to stick to your ass. And my patients actually made me gowns for uh, each other. The number one thing that people want is a human experience of real care and love and medical attention from somebody they trust. Second thing people wanted from the town hall testimony is they wanted integrative health care, meaning they wanted to be met spiritually, emotionally, physically. They didn't just want Western medicine. The reason why it's taken over by corruption is because unfortunately medical students and physicians have been complicit with this because they've been methodically dehumanized to the point where they're not fighting for their own rights or the rights of their patients. You know what I mean? I don't even have words to describe some of the things. I'm on a suicide hotline every day with uh, people who are suffering the end result of these sorts of training programs. And um, I don't have words to describe what it's like. It's, it's, it's um, terrifying. It's terrifying to me. Um, and the end result is we have the third largest cause of death in the country is medical mistakes induced by physicians who are sleep deprived and completely tormented of their human rights to the point of suicide. But the point is doctors have the highest suicide rate of any profession and one million Americans every year lose their doctors to suicide, which is huge. It's a public health crisis. So I think we need to say it out loud. We need to actually track the data, which people have been disinterested in tracking. It's kind of hard to solve a problem if you don't have the data, right? Now, I've investigated 1,300 doctor suicides that I've compiled in a registry, so I understand that, like, the highest risk uh, specialty is anesthesia, and we lose more male anesthesiologists than any other combination of gender and specialty, and most of them are by uh, overdose, and many of them happen inside hospitals, right? So I think if we start to see what the actual numbers are and who's dying, we can start to actually implement programs to help these people. And all we need to do as a caring civilization and medical system is to address the concerns in their suicide notes. Like that would be a way to honor the victims, is to actually stop doing what they have said they experienced in their suicide notes, which many of them have experienced bullying, hazing, other mistreatments, and as a result, they're dying. And so when you start to ask people to work 80, 100, 120, 168 hours a week, which is all the hours in a week, then you're asking the human body to do things that's impossible, which will lead to death and physiologic instability and disease, right? And also medical mistakes, which are the third leading cause of death in the United States. So just as an example, um, there was a, there was a hospitalist that had a seizure from overwork. And so the administrators of the hospital told this uh, J1 visa doctor to get right back into the ICU and keep taking care of patients. I mean, they saw him. It was a witnessed seizure from sleep deprivation in the hospital, and they forced him to get back to work. Not only is this leading to hallucinations, seizures, and life-threatening problems for the person working the shifts, but your fetus is going to die. Like, your baby's not going to make it either. So there's a lot of miscarriage and then these people aren't given time off to grieve. It's like, go to the bathroom, dump your fetus in the toilet, right? And then get back to work. I know of a physician who had like a stable relationship for 10 years in love with the woman that they've been dating since they were high school sweethearts and it only took like a few months of his internship, of his residency to destroy their 10 year marriage. Um, there are also doctors who are so tired at the end of their shifts that they're getting in fatal car accidents on the way home and they're dying and also the, they're hitting cars full of families that are dying on their summer vacations, you know what I mean? Like as a result, people are like jumping off the rooftops of hospitals during their shifts. I mean, it's really brutal. It's like, people wouldn't believe what goes on. How I know all this is I run a suicide hotline for physicians, and so I have been on the phone with thousands of suicidal doctors. Pretty much not a day goes by where I'm not on the phone with one or two of them. This is seven years straight, <laughs> and so uh, sometimes I'm on the phone with them for like two hours uh, or more with one person talking to them listening 
to all the things that they're telling me that they've experienced, which sound, some of them, really extreme. And then I realize, oh, I've heard this before, the same extreme thing that seems like almost unbelievable that they've just survived is the same story I heard from this other guy last week. So I start to put the stories together and I noticed that there's patterns of behavior going on in which the human rights of our medical trainees are being chronically violated in such heinous ways that these people are destabilized to the point of wanting to kill themselves. These are sensitive people that went into medicine to help and heal others and they're being told to lie and expect them to generate a pretty massive amount of income through seeing more patients than it's safe to see and billing at levels higher than what they actually performed. And they're pretty much told, like, this is the way it is. Like, this is how we're going to get the funding for our hospital, forcing them to work more efficiently and not complain about seeing patients every seven minutes. Do you see how this works? Suicide is, a, is oftentimes an impulsive act. Processes that are psychological processes have strong environmental influences. So what happens to you makes a big difference in terms of your uh, in terms of your psychology. You know it unnerves me when I lose control and I'm all out of options and I'm out of my head then I build my life around someone who I thought that I was but it turns out all the things I do to feel young they only make me old. This is a uh, a uh, situation in which we're all losing. We're, we're, everyone's losing. The patients are losing, the medical students are losing, the physicians are losing. Uh, this does not bear out well for nurses or other administrative staff. Like, I mean, nobody wins. The only people that are winning is a core group of people that are profiteering directly from the pain of the abuse. And there are people, unfortunately, in power positions right now, profiteering off of this sick system. And so the only way to change it is to describe what's going on and to start telling the truth, right? And I think all of us should be very concerned that our doctors are dying at three times the rate of the general public by suicide. I can tell you what I think is gonna be the best is not really any system that's better than other system. What we really need is a grassroots revolution in which people are practicing medicine from a place of their highest values and ethics, from their heart and soul, from the intention they had when they started medical school. You are yeah, yeah. one paycheck away from yeah. being being poor and destitute. And then that influence your stress, your cortisol. Would yeah, then you start getting into the mental health and the physical health. But even that is some kind of behavioral thing that's going to set you up to make certain choices in life. So that's less related to what system will work and more related to the power of the individual to prevail in following their dreams and practicing medicine in alignment with their values and you can do that in any type of system. I had a meeting once when I was at Mental Health America with the, the, the director of the National Institutes of Health. Sometimes the most terrifying things can actually be the most beautiful. Great guy, Francis Collins, he's still the director of the NIH. It needs to be the people that understand the humanity, that understand the biology and understand the science and the art. together the head of Heart, Lung, and Blood, the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of NIDA, of Drug Abuse. And what we wanted to talk about was the fact that people with severe mental illnesses in our country die on average 25 years before their life expectancy. <laughs> So we were getting together with uh, with these institute directors and with the head of the NIH. That someone who has diabetes, well, you know, of course they're depressed because they have a chronic illness. Uh, but but there's increasingly evidence to show that people who develop depression are at higher risk to develop disabil uh, diabetes. Um, and again, I'm speaking beyond the data now, but I think at some point we're going to find out that there's there are common pathophysiological processes that underlie the development of these conditions and the first uh, problems we're going to see are going to show up as behavioral problems. And those, if they're not attended to, they increase the risk for the development of these other chronic illnesses. 15,000 miles to just see it.
love to see more of a like some kind of really powerful wellness curriculum get established yeah. to deal with mental health and emotional health and just your physical yeah. and that's what the, you're putting in your mouth and the ec economic incentives are just not there so part of it is re-educating both the educators and the community and then the community coming together with everybody right to figure out like how are we going to do this it's like it's going to take a revolution and it was halfway through when when i realized it's worth it because we are these people i don't know if it's worth it So I think the main impediment to this is that our medical students are caving to, um, they're being homogenized and dehumanized methodically by our medical education system. And when you have a group of basically factory worker robots as doctors, then they're going to basically screw up every system. And when you finally do get in there, they're running behind and then they hurry you through and send you out with yet another prescription. So we are not impressed. I practice right now uh, internal medicine in a different setting. We are all being graded, uh, not really by the patients, that's being a priority. We are being measured by a lot of different measures. Our length of stay is being measured, our um, time with the patients being measured by the insurance our uh, but it's not of course it's important for quality but not always meeting patients needs uh, I don't have a uh, a doctor that I go to on a regular basis right now so I get my insurance through the government um, and it just sort of prevents me from keeping the same doctor find a doctor that really cares about you and watch what you eat I think our doctor actually cares for her patients but I think the office or the, or the personnel or the management gets in the way of all of that. The, the dollar gets yeah. in the way of it. You need three things to make, uh, to make a difference. Uh, you need science, you need to be able to implement the science, and you need to have the political will uh, to, get, uh, to get that done. We have a formidable amount of science about what we can do to make a big difference in terms of, uh, of well-being. So implementation is a challenge, but we're, we're making some progress there. And the political will, I think, is the thing where we really, and again, that's where advocacy comes in. I'm sure that there are tons and tons of doctors out there who have good hearts and are good people. Um, and I'm sure that their argument is that if I could change it, I would. And at what point do we start to ask ourselves, you know, when do you give over to the system that is unhealthy for everyone? And when do you fight against it and try to change it? What we need to do is like remember who we are as people and not give up our dreams and practice medicine in alignment with our values. And if we each did that, it would be a completely different world in healthcare. Like, I don't think, I think the most important thing is probably to stop blaming other people for our problems and for each of us to look in the mirror and say, what is it that I can do differently as a second year medical student, a third year medical student, a resident, a physician, to practice medicine in alignment with my values and not tolerate an abusive system. My voice matters, I matter. If I stand up for my rights, then I'm standing up for the rights of my brothers and sisters and my patients. Every time a medical student, a resident, gives up their rights and kowtows to a system that is abusive, they are the problem. They are creating a problem in which they are relinquishing their personal power to be a healer, and they are causing problems not only for themselves because 
they're going to become depressed and suicidal. They're also not able to take care of their patients. They're also not able to stand up to corrupt hospital systems, insurance companies, and everyone else who's running off to the bank with all the money that you're generating. So the solution, the only solution that I really see that's going to work is that the victims, which are the healers, stand up and take back their power and be true healers in this country and stop giving away their healing art to corrupt systems. I don't think my doctor cares at all. The last time I complained about some aches in my joints, she just laughed at me and said, welcome to old age. A lot of times she's told me that I'm really overweight and doesn't really give me anything to help with that. Imagine being sick and uh, they ask you the questions that are not pertin pertinent to your health, only just to meet the measures. So I think we have to recognize our individual patients, be the advocate. And in all challenges we are facing right now, still our patients should be priority. And that should be the future of healthcare. Thank you. Do I think my doctor cares? I think my doctor cares to an extent, like they, you know, they got into that line of work for a reason. I've worked with a doctor who starts his day at 7 in the morning and doesn't finish seeing patients until midnight, and then we're there until 2 a.m. doing paperwork. I've seen that, and he's exhausted and, you know, but he, he just had such a big heart and he couldn't not see the patient that had breast cancer and needed to be seen. So he waited and he stayed and he did it. but. That's very uh, draining on a person and, you know, that's not safe because things get skipped or missed or, you know. Sorry. Cool beans. I don't know if you can see her, guys, but she is. Oh, oh wow. Sleeping. That's why my son's a real is. human being. That's cool. Yeah. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> Yasmin, you had, you had no idea when this guy walked up to you, he was going to make you into a movie star with your daughter? <laughs> I had no clue. Here we wow. are. Wow. <laughs> Y'all, I appreciate it. Brian, you it's crazy that I that the place that I was before I before I went to you was Houston. I was in Houston, and then and then I met you, and you're like, I moved from Houston. So yeah, just really just like I was saying, everything just yeah. happened. And it's <laughs> like, I think it's more than just a coincidence. I it's been an honor, really, to to be able to watch this film come together. I can see that the problem is bigger than the healthcare system. Fighting for life, yet you're putting up walls, being pulled in every direction, but we don't know where to go. How many minds do we need to lose? Is anybody else getting tired of this mess? Tired of being shut down, but I must run I don't really know what I do myself. It's one of the major themes that emerges from uh, from the film is that the things that drive medical care actually contributes a very small part 
of, uh, of, of overall uh, health status. The thing that drives it are the social determinants. It's where people live, where they grow up, uh, what they're exposed to. about the same amount of money as uh, all of our uh, comparison countries in uh, in the developed world, but we're spending hours disproportionately on medical care um, and less so on, uh, on the things that actually drive differences in health status. You know, to watch your child be successful. You! I'm talking about you! <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it's up to the individual person and how you were brought up, how you were raised. I always find it interesting that people find that as surprising. Uh, we live with this sort of illusion that because, you know, because we're so technologically advanced, we have absolutely the best health status in the country and the world. And that's, we're nowhere near, uh, nowhere near the best.